Holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fool. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs, of course. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicum? I was never a good reader. Ah, Immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? You're not even supposed to use the word fat. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of the audiobook podcast. I'm Justine Sloan Lees, and in this podcast, we discuss what goes on behind the stories in the production of audiobooks. In today's episode, we're joined by Olivia Mackenzie Smith. Olivia's an Australian born actress, voice actor, audiobook narrator, and director based in LA. We first met her a few years ago when she was directing a title recorded here in our Melbourne studios remotely from LA, and we've gone on to work on several more projects with her, so it's really great to actually have the time to chat about audiobooks. We've had a good yarn already, so let's jump right into today's episode. Olivia, how has your career path evolved over the years? Well, like any actor, it morphs and shapes as we go along, but yeah, originally started out drama in high school and then three years of drama school in Sydney. And then I went on to study in Stella Adler in New York after that. And so the first, I guess the formative years, I was really just soaking in and sucking up all the study and the various techniques that I possibly could initially. And then I came back to Australia after America and did little bits of TV and commercial and like how we all start off, short films, indie films, all that kind of stuff. And I didn't actually get into the voiceover world too much until I actually came to America for the second time, I should say. And that was to LA? Yes. Uh, Yeah, the second time round was LA. The first time was New York. Um, Well, there was a third time actually, which was San Francisco (laughs) as well. I've I've come back and forth. I studied in San Francisco for a little bit as well. And then... Australia was also a lot of theatre and I kind of let the theatre go a little bit when I moved over here. So my life is still very much the acting of all different styles except for the theatre at this point and also doing bits of writing and, of course, directing voiceover, which is why I'm here. And so how did that come about? So I actually had a friend who has done audiobook narration for numerous publication houses for years and years. And not long after moving, he moved here in 2010 for the second time round. And it was a couple of years into moving here. He suggested me, we've obviously given the accent, they were after an Australian. And so I went into audition for Penguin Random House and then subsequently got that job. And while I was there, they asked if I wanted to do some proofing for them, some QC proofing on the back end. Yes. And not long after that, they also then asked if I wanted to do directing. So I've kind of done the proofing, narration and directing at this point. So I kind of fell into it through a friend because audiobooks really wasn't on my radar at that point. I got a voiceover agent, but I just hadn't thought about audiobooks for whatever reason. I don't know. It's such a a niche and it's obviously really developed over the years and become a lot more popular, especially over here in America. But yeah, it's this cool little pocket of voiceover that really took me by surprise. And did you fall in love with it? I did. Yeah. And the people too, because I feel like it is such a tight knit group, or at least over here anyway, and I'm sure it is in Australia. I know we all just get to know each other and for some reason, maybe because it is such a smaller part of the community rather than perhaps animation. And for years and years, other voiceover and commercials are so competitive. I feel like because of the smaller community initially, the people that I always encounter in the audiobook world are really friendly and welcoming and lovely. And I've made some really good friends. Yeah, I find that when I teach acting students, I say to them, look, I understand audiobooks aren't for everyone, but for the people who do do it and like it, they tend to love it. Yeah, I have found that too, not only directing side, but the narration side as well, where some people, they're lovers of books and that's how they get into it, or they just, you know, happen to be really good storytellers on that medium. I've worked with some actors in the booth before as a director who are, you know, well known on perhaps TV or film and they get into the booth to do their first ever book and they 
kind of step back and go, oh, my God, like whether it's like the end of the first day and they're like, I am exhausted. I don't know how people do this. <laughs> if that's what you mean, either love it or they, it's not meant for them. Yeah, I remember reading an article once about audiobook narrators. This was a British article. And Dame Judi Dench's daughter is a very prolific audiobook narrator and she has hundreds of titles to her name, but she was saying her mum hates it. <laughs> <laughs> she just can't go. she can't relax she can't get in the zone she just stumbles and yeah. just doesn't feel at home but you know you think she's one of our great actresses absolutely dame, dame judy she's one of the one of the best yeah i know it's just and that's okay though it's just like anyone in any creative field just because you're a painter it doesn't mean you're a great sculptor or you know similar art form but just different areas within it and some people find their little comfy spot and others don't so yeah my favorite australian actress i won't name her because i'm about to say that she doesn't like doing audiobooks anymore because she just gets too anxious and i've been admiring her work for nearly three decades and I've seen her on film and lots on stage. She's a really powerful performer and she's done a few audiobooks but she just gets too anxious and she can't relax and so she's decided mm-hmm. to just not do it anymore. She's got a beautiful voice. We'd love to have her in but she just said, no, it's just not working for me. Fair enough. That's okay. Like I said, it's not for everyone. And some people go into it, obviously, enthused and good intentions and really want to give it a a red hot go and absolutely give it a go. But just be aware that it may not be for you. Yeah. And sometimes people prefer certain types of titles, like they might prefer doing nonfiction where it's that more matter of fact tone rather than fiction where you've got a lot of character voices and that kind of thing. So we just try to keep that in mind when we're casting people. And I'm sure that the publishers you work for keep that kind of thing in mind as well. Absolutely. Especially if you're a new narrator and you're starting out and then they can kind of see where your strong suit is and where your voice might fit. Like you said, whether it's nonfiction or YA or Mm. kids even. And sometimes that's inherent in your natural vocal tone straight off the bat. If you've got a really high voice, then you're like straight to YA. (laughs) Off you go. (laughs) So let's talk about how you prepare for a title as a director and as a narrator, if you prepare differently and what kind of resources you use for preparation and tips and tricks that you use in both those roles, director and narrator. Sure. Uh, There are definitely some crossovers between the two. And the first big one is reading the actual book. It's, um, (laughs) it seems like such a simple thing, but it's amazing. The amount of people that I have worked with who do not read the book. Yeah. Or it's evident that they haven't. Oh, they um, haven't got to the end. They've started it, they've read ahead to where they think they'll get each day, but they haven't got to the end. Yes. And sometimes that's okay and that works out and hopefully the director, you know, they've read it and they can guide you if you haven't necessarily read the whole thing as the narrator. But if you do have the time, definitely read the book as a narrator and as a director, absolutely. Now, I've worked with some narrators as a director who they are so busy and they literally have no time to read book after book after book after book, which is great for them. And so I have heard some people employ, uh, like they have like an assistant. Right. Yeah. There's some that are so run off their feet. They have an assistant who will read it for them and then give a whole synopsis, character breakdowns for them, any accents, all that kind of stuff. Which leads me to another part of the prep that both on the directing and the narrating side that should be done is, of course, noting down characters, accents, any clues that the author gives us is there for a reason. So use it, you know, if you can. And also not just the characters, but the book in general. Obviously, you know, the genre will hopefully give away what you should do as a narrator and as a director and how to guide them. But also just the tone of the book also helps. Is it first person? All that kind of thing really comes into play. The location, where is it set? Are there any accents? Because it can just help your performance overall as a narrator. As a director, I note all that stuff down anyway, even though I'm not going to be with the one doing it. Because sometimes, as I said, there's some busy people who will get to a certain part of the book, maybe they haven't read, and they'll go, oh, is this person, is this Scottish or Irish? And you're like, oh, as a director, I make a note just like I would as a narrator. 
And on the narration front, I also, for the characters, I highlight all the dialogue. I colour code all the different characters. I don't know whether that's a little too... Uh, <laughs> but for me, it's just an easy way for me to not lose track. Yep. Naturally, you read ahead a little bit, but just so I can easily keep track of all the characters and who's coming up next. Yeah, I think if people are visual people, that that little automatic trigger just really helps the brain kind of make the connection with the characters. Absolutely. And as a director, sorry if I'm skipping between the director and the narrator part, uh, they cross over a lot, but Another thing is writing down words, highlighting any different languages and words that you might have to look up. And again, I personally do that as a narrator. If there are some people that fall back on the director to have done that work, but I like to do it as a narrator anyway, because I just don't, I just rather not take anything to chance and not have to stop and interrupt the recording and have to stop and look things up. Sometimes that does happen and that's okay. And often it doesn't take long to look something up, especially too if it's it's funny as an Australian working predominantly in America, sometimes I'll question a pronunciation and sometimes I realise, oh no, I'm enforcing my Australian English <laughs> onto them <laughs> slash British English. But sometimes they catch me by surprise too. It's funny because it depends on where they're from in, in America. You know, there might be aunt versus aunt mm. or things like that. And I and that's where, where sometimes I might question a, a pronunciation for them. And maintain consistency. I think that's a big part of that. Once you've made the decision, we're going to do it this way, then you just have to be really careful about the consistency. Yeah, I, I second that for sure. It just helps on the back end. If QC comes back and they flag it, then, you know, you're obviously cutting out your workload for you on the back end with any pickups. Mm. So that's also a good reason to try and get it right the first time. Have you heard of Forvo? Yep. My preference is always to go to How Just Say first because I think it's more authoritative because uh, Forvo is user-generated content and that always has inbuilt issues. I know of uh, a book I recorded for a client in LA and it was in a title about Aboriginal Australia and I got back a pickup in the QC notes where they'd gone with the Forvo pronunciation of an Aboriginal word and it was just so wrong. So I had to find a, another reference to go back to them and say, look, actually, you can't rely on Forvo in this instance. But it is certainly not to be discounted, but I always go first to how to say. How'd you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, for proper nouns, for place names and people's names, Uglish is so great. Yeah. For those that don't know who are listening, Uglish, it's like every instance of a particular word you might be looking for or a noun, like you said, a noun, name, name of a place. It's like a search engine for everything, every video on YouTube where that word or name might be said and it goes straight to where it is in the straight video. Straight to where. So it'd be a two-hour video and you just get the five-second clip where they say the word. And what's great about it is you can listen to different versions. So you might get variations, say, if it's someone. Uh, I Greta Thunberg was one I had to look up recently because a lot of American, mm. if you find you know news stories come up, they say Thunberg. And I was like, I don't think that's right. And so I just went through till I found her saying her own name. And obviously that's the most authoritative version. So that's the <laughs> one you go with. I had to look her up too recently yeah. for a book about climate change. Yep. But I agree. Go for the native speaker if you can or and the author if you need the author's name. Yes. Pre-Uglish, I don't know when Uglish came out, but pre-Uglish, it was a, <laughs> a, a real uh, pain to yeah. trudge through All YouTube. All the clips, and yep. Yep. That's right. Yeah, you had to go and find the clips yourself. And I learned about it about two years ago, And but I'm not sure how long it's been in existence. You know, like for, say, an Australian place name, I'd be searching around real estate agent clips, you know, because often they'll post ads online for properties they're selling. So, you know, it'll say it'll be the local real estate agent saying, welcome to this beautiful property at 5 Beautiful Drive, Brewarrina. And you go, all right, Brewarrina, that's it, Brewarrina. <laughs> He's a local real estate agent. I think I trust him. But, uh, yeah, with Uglish, it cuts out all that legwork. So it's really a time saver. Similar to real estate ones is if Uglish, you know, may not come up with something, I just go to Google or whatever and just punch in what you're looking for. And more often than not, same thing with town names or things, there'll be a news quite often. Local news. Local news is great too, mm. which is fantastic. And then 
If all else fails again, then it goes down to even more basics. You can call up the local library. That's right. (laughs) I call up the local library of where I need to, you know, find out a pronunciation. And invariably they laugh at your attempt to pronounce it and say, no, it's not like that. It's like this. And you go, oh, (laughs) glad I rang. So true. So true. I know. So often how the locals say it may not be how a politician might say it or something like that. And I've also called up when it comes to things that are a little further afield and foreign, I have called up consulates before when I've had to look up a particular, I don't know, a country in Africa and I'm just not going to find that name anywhere. And I've just gone, can I just steal just two seconds of your time? (laughs) (laughs) Look, I generally find that people appreciate the effort you're making to do it correctly and they're happy to help. So I agree. I think for the listener experience, there's lots of listeners who aren't going to know the work you put into it and that it's right and, you know, but the people from that place are always appreciative because there's nothing more annoying than it's like for me here in Melbourne when I hear people say Melbourne in the American way. It's like, (laughs) I understand. I'll tell you a little trick I say to narrators if they don't have time to read the book or they're skimming the book is to do a word search on the word accent and they will come up with any references to a character having an accent because there's nothing more annoying than the person who hasn't prepped properly and you get halfway through the book and you discover someone's got random accent and they've done all the dialogue straight. So I don't know if there's many synonyms for accent. So I think if you do the word search on the word accent, you're going to straight away and come up with any references and you can get around reading the whole book if you haven't got time and not getting caught on one of those. Absolutely. And I think my colleague Yen, he often does a spell check and any words that come up in the spell check. So, for example, we're doing a lot of Aboriginal Australian titles and so there's lots of Aboriginal language in that. And so Yen does a spell check and up comes any of those Aboriginal words and in the spell check because um, Windows doesn't recognise it. And so he knows automatically what he's got to check out, you know, and he can form a list of words to research. If you have access, especially as a director and or narrator, and I guess producer too, if you have access to the author, if there's something that's still not quite clear, because I've had this before where I directed a book, this is many years ago, and it was a series. I think it was maybe a trilogy. But so for the first book, the main character was described as being born in Scotland, but lived most of his life in London and travelled around. He was kind of like espionage kind of. And so second book comes around, the author (laughs) decides to plonk in there that he's got a thick Glaswegian accent, Mm. which we had not done in book one. The narrator was English and so that caught us out. How are we to know, I guess? But I find it always when there's something just not said, you know, clear enough where it could go either way in a book like that, then if you have access to the author, it's good to always double check. And sometimes they may not realise they've made the mistake and it's actually useful for them to point things out to them and say, was this intentional because this is a bit different? I did a book that was about Australia's involvement in World War One, and the then Prime mm. Minister, Billy Hughes, was born in Wales. And halfway through the book, after lots of dialogue, it said in his thick Welsh accent, and the reader turned to me in horror, the narrator turned to me in horror and went, what? I can't do a Welsh accent. And people do, from, Welsh is one of those accents, people go, oh, my God, I don't know, I can't do a Welsh it's accent. Hard. But I said, yeah. no, I've seen film clips on, you know, history docos on tally of Billy Hughes speaking, and he had a broad Australian accent. And so I found a clip on YouTube and sent it on to the publisher, and I said, look, Halfway through the book, it says Billy Hughes in his broad Welsh accent, but he really didn't have a broad Welsh accent. And they were very grateful and apologetic and said, yeah, just delete that reference. That is an author error. So, well, phew. (laughs) (laughs) To the relief of all of us. (laughs) No, I know. I imagine you'll agree that I think a broad general knowledge is really helpful in, in this area. Absolutely. You'll get a book that is in your wheelhouse and then sometimes it's just, it requires a little more, you know, deep diving and digging in. And also I find as time goes by, I check things more and more. You know, often there'll be a a book with lots of words. You've had to look, say, one of these Aboriginal titles, for example, it's full of Wiradjuri language and we've done Mm -hmm. all the research. And then you'll get tripped up on an English word that you, one of those words, you know what it means, but it's not something you'd use in conversation like behemoth. 
I have to check that every time. I'm still wrong, aren't I? I have to check it every time. Behemoth. Behemoth, yeah, exactly. So every time I see that, I know I need to check it because I know I've got to be in my bonnet about it. (laughs) And so sometimes, yeah, the English language you trip up on, you get all the Wiradjuri perfect and then you trip up on some English word. But it's so easy to do and it's so common where you've, you know, worked with narrators who, and I'm sure I've done this too, you know, they say a word a particular way and then you question and you pick them up or maybe and ask and then I double check with the dictionary because obviously the you know whether it's a British uh, narrator or American narrator I'll look up you know Oxford versus Merriam Webster yes absolutely yep and so you know sometimes it happens where they're like oh my I've been saying it this way yes my yes. whole life are you trying to tell me exactly. I've been saying it in or oh, like I said there are some Americans that I work with that uh, sometimes it's funny I find it's more east coast people versus west coast or middle of America east coast tend to lean toward a, a British English sometimes mm, yeah with certain words and that's and it's quite funny and obviously it depends on where the book's set sometimes that's got to be changed up we're only human <laughs> you know no I had someone say it was detritus and she was saying detritus and I was saying, no, there's more T's than that. It's detritus. She said, but I've been saying detritus my whole life. <laughs> Sorry to break it to your girlfriend, but you've been oh. saying it wrong your whole life. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. I know. It's not uncommon at all. So don't feel silly. If, if that happens to you, don't feel silly. We all It's just occupational hazard. Yeah. So when you're narrating, do you um, self-direct or are, are you working with the director? Or does it vary? It varies. It varies. Mainly I work with a director. Again, it just depends on who you're working for. Penguin Random House like to have directors. Harper, not so much. Uh, Simon & Schuster, it goes both ways. So it really just depends on who you're working with. I would prefer to be directed if I have the option to do it because I have been on both sides of the mic. I don't like to get in my head too much. And so if I have the option, then absolutely. Or, Or if they're automatically providing it for you, then great just so you've got that extra set of ears and you're not having to do everything yourself. Yeah, take advantage of it if it comes to you. Yeah, I think that is one difference in audiobook production between the States and Australia. The States, as I understand it, I um, have worked as a director on a title for HarperCollins in New York and they very much a director and engineer. Hilariously, the engineer was in Auckland, so I was directing them in Auckland, the talent and the engineer in Auckland via Zoom, but the engineer had done lots of audiobooks. He was absolutely fabulous. So I think that maybe budgets for some of the bigger publishers in the States are higher, and so they are happy to spend that money, whereas here it tends to be you're a director slash engineer, so there's just the one person in the booth. Right. But also, is that the case? Is that what you think with the States? Um, yeah, I would imagine probably the budgets are a, a little more generous perhaps. Um, Certainly for high-profile titles. Absolutely. And so I think that's the case. And I, and I think there are some, like I said, the ones that sometimes go both ways. Like as a director, I, for example, worked with a narrator who was given a book. I think it was Simon and Schuster. He was a, an American narrator, but the book was set in Australia. So he had to do a lot of Australian accents and he requested me, knowing me and that we'd worked together before. He went to Simon and Schuster and said, look, I know we haven't got a director on this, but is it in the budget for me to be able to have one? Because I would really love someone to, you know, hold my hand on this one who is Australian. So, you know, they look at their budget. If there's room, then they can make it happen for sure. Yeah. And also in the States, there's some people who self-record. We uh, had a fabulous narrator here, Anthea Greco, who moved to the States a few years ago and she got a green card. And She'd done a number of books for us and she's a great narrator and she's now got a home studio set up and she's recording audio books at home by herself. She also does proofing for us. So I think that experience of proofing like you had can be really Mm -hmm. useful both for a narrator and a director because they're the ones who are doing the the QC and realising what's problematic and what's not, like what you can just let slide, that's fine, that's not going to affect the listener experience. This is, this needs to be fixed. Yeah. I mean, I didn't do it for as long as I've been directing and narrating. I I probably did it for, I don't know, 18 months to a couple of years, you know, on and off when I first started out. But I absolutely, I agree. It really helped. And even just listening to a lot of audiobooks, 
listening as a narrator and a director too. listen, okay, what works? What's keeping me engaged? What's not? Just on the performance side of things too. I thought it was really invaluable to be listening to nonstop audiobooks just as a listener, as a proofer. And like you said, yeah, the technical aspects too, where there's stuff where, okay, I'm not going to be so particular about that. However, there are some people who work QC who are very particular and there are some that aren't way more relaxed and they don't worry too much. Yeah. And then it's our job as director when we get those notes to say, look, yes, there is a very slight noise there, but I've had to play it twice to identify where the noise is. And I don't think someone who's listening with earbuds on the tram will ever (laughs) hear it. (laughs) <laughs> true, true. Have you worked with a listening library? No. Well, they have in particular, because they do a lot of kids' books and YA under their umbrella. And because, as the name suggests, a lot of their books go into libraries and a lot of the kids read along with the physical book as they listen. Like, you know, good old, you know, books on tape kind of yep. the, the way things used to be. And Whenever I get given a listening library book, that is when I know we have to be absolutely word perfect. Even sometimes they they get a little particular on, you know, like Ds on the end of words Mm. and things like that, where they really have to hear because whether it's kids learning to read or adults, they're teaching themselves English. Second language, yes. Right. So that's where they can be particular. And that I understand. And Mm. that's okay. What I have learned, one thing I have learned doing titles for American publishing houses is that Americans literally say every syllable because Australians, (laughs) we we allied that into sort of two and a half. And (laughs) and so I now know if I'm doing a title for Podium um, or HarperCollins or someone like that, I have to make sure that library is, you know, three syllables exactly long. All those L-Y words, they really emphatically say each syllable. So it's like... They do. Yeah. They do. And... It's funny too, narrating a, a, and I'm sure you've had this too, working with American uh, publishers, it's an Australian book that has an American release. And so they have obviously changed all the words uh, and yeah. to, I know, even though it's said, it's said in Australia, the whole thing are Australian characters. And yet there's still a character in there that says, hold on a sec, I just got to nick down to the gas station. Yeah, yeah. And and not saying petrol station, it just it feels so weird I know. coming off the tongue. So when you're working on a book, either as a narrator or director, what does a work day look like? Do you have full days or half days or how do you work? Um, so full days uh, usually. Um, and, of course, it depends on the you know, size of the book, you know, because sometimes you can work on a little kid's title that only takes half a day to record. And one good thing since the pandemic, all of us working from um, home a lot. The pivot. Um, yes, the pivot <laughs> is, and obviously a lot of narrators, you know, working from home studios and home booths is we're able to have a little more flexibility than perhaps going into a studio. This is in my experience anyway. So as far as how what a full day looks like sometimes, you know, I might have a, you know, narrator who lives in a busy area and they're like, oh, hold on, can we just stop for 10 minutes? The, you know, the leaf blower is going next door or the whippersnipper or the blah, blah, blah. Or so, you know, so we're all having to deal <laughs> with yes. that these days. And then sometimes too, I'll have like a narrator say, oh, I've, I've got an appointment this afternoon. Can I duck out for an hour and come back? Absolutely. So, but generally speaking, my work day tends to start around, I don't know, nine, 10 in the morning and go to a four or five in the afternoon with a, you know, a lunch break and a couple of little, you know, tea breaks in the morning and afternoon. That's generally how it looks as a narrator and a director, both generally speaking. But again, things are flexible. I think we all kind of get each other in the creative worlds where things can crop up and audition can crop up and like, oh, can I just have half an hour so I can whip out this voiceover audition for my agent? Sure. For me, and I think for a lot of the publishers, I don't know if you find this, but as long as we get it done in the allotted the deadline, then I think they don't really mind when we work. And I guess that's the beauty of if you don't have a director and you're just a narrator at home in your booth, you can work at, you know. 3 a.m. 3 a.m. if you really want to. <laughs> um, as long as you get it done on, and in on time, I think they're happy. Mm. Do you work, we work on a, a rule of, 
allowing two hours to record one hour of finished audio. Is that pretty close to what you would, uh, what's expected within the audiobook industry in the States? Yeah, that's roughly around the same. And of yep. course, it's always a bonus when you're working with Jennifer Valetic, who can record five hours of audio in seven hours because she's just a superhuman. Yes. <laughs> That's always lovely. But yeah, if people are taking much over two hours to record an hour of audio, then we're starting to think maybe we give some grace that they're maybe inexperienced and they're just learning. We like their voice and their attitude. We think, well, you know, we'll we'll try and help them. But if someone's taking a long time to record, it's like, yeah, I don't know that uh, this voice work, this audio book work is for you. Uh, again, like you said, it depends on, I guess, their experience experience. But I guess not always, because sometimes it's a, you know, someone who is really experienced, but you get a book that's heavy, or it's a nonfiction, and it's really, you know, tackling some heavy subjects, and you need that little extra time sometimes. It really does depend on the book too, I think. And also sometimes I'll call people when I can hear they're getting brain fade, you know, because they're starting to make more mistakes. Yes. And it's like, you know what, let's just call it quits for today and come in in the morning and you'll be fresher and we'll get it done more quickly because you won't be making these mistakes, these sort of random sort of pronunciations and mistakes and stumbles because you just, you know, you'll be much fresher and ready to go. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. I've had to do that a few times too, where you just call it. More often than not too, obviously a lot of people you work with are experienced, but then there's sometimes you work with an author yes. who's never read a book never performed, never acted. It's a practice, you know, it takes a lot out of a person, especially after day one. One thing that I always recommend for experienced narrators, but especially authors or first-time readers, is go home first day, because first day obviously can take it out of you a lot. Go home, rest your voice, try not to speak, and just chill out and have some good food and, yeah. and rest and get some good a good night's sleep because it really helps. And I always reassure people on the first day that the first day is the hardest. It will feel like it's going more slowly, just getting used to the studio, getting settled into the book. And that's the reason why sometimes, I don't know if you do this as a narrator or a director, but at the end of the book, if we've got a little bit of time and we thought the first day was a bit hard, we might go back and re-record the first chapter. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes that might be my call as a director, but sometimes that comes from the narrator where they're like, ugh. Now that I've gotten into it, I feel like I was maybe yep. off the mark for that first chapter. And, and absolutely, if there's time at the end to go back and do that. And I now make a policy of telling people that on the first day, particularly as said, author narrators, at the end, we can go back and re-record the beginning because by the end, you'll be totally in the zone. And I find just by saying that, they relax. And that really we yeah. have to do it because they've just gone, oh, fuel. They're not overthinking their performance. They just start relaxing and just getting into the zone. And I just find that really worthwhile to do on the first day. Just say, if we want to, we can. And it just changes them. Yeah, I know. And, and especially with those first time readers or authors is to just get them out of their yeah. head a little bit. And so take the stress off. That's a great idea. Yeah. What are your tall tales but true from the booth, things you've heard or seen or done that you can share with us? Have you ever had to ask anyone to take their bra off? No. I've done it twice now. Is that Well, a because thing? both times the bras were making noise. and The first time it was the fabric of the bra <laughs> rubbing against the fabric of the shirt. And I thought, my God, I've never had to do this before. But, you know, it was a problem because, you know, every time she took a big breath and her chest expanded. And then the second time it was the underwires of her bra, another person, same thing. She took a big, deep lateral breath into her lower lungs oh. and her underwire of her bra was squeaking. Wow. I kept stopping and saying, where's that noise? What's that noise? I can hear a noise. And she was saying, I can't hear anything. <laughs> it's like, no, there's something. And then she, as I was talking to her and she went, what are you talking about? Like sort of big breath. And that's, that's it. That's it. And she said, oh, my God, it's my bra. <laughs> So, oh, no. So you haven't had to do that. <laughs> no, I've never. No, I've asked them, you know, to take off jackets or jewellery. and Jewellery and, yeah. Air, yeah. You know, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but no, never a problem. <laughs> That's fascinating. I've had some emotional moments. Um, yes. In particular where, uh, 
you know, as a director, I've worked with a narrator, but this is pre-COVID when we're all in person, you know, when the content really hits home for a narrator Mm -hmm. uh, and all me, but but where someone's perhaps just lost a mother to cancer and then in the book is someone who is similarly going through an, an experience. So things like that where I've had to stop recording and give them a good old hug and take a break and that kind of thing happens. There are tissues in the studio for a reason. We need them. Yes, absolutely. And then sometimes too, it's not necessarily whether you can, sometimes it's, you don't necessarily relate to the content, but sometimes if it's just such a well-written book and you're so immersed in the story, which is what we hope for, and it just gets to you and starts to, and you've got to have a break for that reason where you're just um, overcome with with emotion. I had a very experienced narrator and she also does a huge amount of voiceover. She's like Melbourne's voiceover queen. And it was a dying dog in a novel, a death of a dog. And she literally could only get out one sentence before she just sort of collapsed into tears, sobs oh, again. So just we, we had to read sort of about two pages, almost line by line, so she could get through it. Yes. And she just said, anything dogs, I just can't. Oh, dearie me. <laughs> so we got there in the end, but it was a little bit of a slow patch there. Yes, yes. And then on the other end of the spectrum, I've had, well, and me personally, where I just crack up. The giggles. What absolute giggles. Can't get rid of them. Again, you need to just step away sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's just break time. That's just <laughs> let's go around, put the kettle on. <laughs> Especially if it's a particular sentence that you're getting stuck on or you're uh, you know, or you've said something and again, occupational hazard, you swear you read something on the page that it is what it is and it just comes out. It's a totally different word and it's just and it ends up being hilarious, whatever you end up saying. Yes, um, indeed. So what's the hardest thing you've ever done? Um as a narrator and or director? Okay, both are non-fictions. As a narrator, I did a non-fiction book on Korea and Kim Jong-un and it was like 500 pages or so. Not only was it long, but man, oh man, all those Korean pronunciations, it was mm. a lot. But it was more just getting the names, places, all of that correct. That was quite tough. And similarly, on the direction front, one that sticks out in my mind, it was a book on Russian history and about the czars and the fall of of the empire and everything. And it, wow, wow. Because a lot of the time, I don't know if you've found this, with various languages, so in a book that's obviously been translated to English, they will give the English word. So often when you look up that word as a director, it doesn't come up. So what I had Mm. to do was put that word into Cyrillic and then... Oh, my. Yes, I found it's out there. You need it. I can't remember the website right now, but there's a a website where you put it in English and it comes up in Cyrillic. And so I had to do that. I can't begin to tell you. It was probably like 500 words, 600 words. Mm, Gosh. And so that was a lot of prep on the front end. Yeah. And for titles like that, mm-hmm. would you be paid extra for prep time? Yes. Generally speaking, not automatically. You kind of have to ask for it. Or if mm. the producer you're working with, whatever publication you're working with, they are clued into where it might head as far as prep goes. And then sometimes too, if that hasn't been offered, I will just say, hey, just so you know, this took a little extra <laughs> time than the average yeah. book. Is there any wiggle room in the budget to give maybe a, a little extra on this one? And more often than not, I've never had anyone say no to that because they okay. they know they know how much mm. you, you got to put into it sometimes. You're also a screenwriter. So do you find the different prongs of your work, screenwriting, narrating and voice work, directing, are they sort of complementary to each other? Do things from each of them feed into the others? I always liked reading as a kid. Yeah. But I wouldn't have called myself an avid reader. I was the kind of kid who I would read a book and then boom, I was into it and I couldn't put it down. But then I might take another few months before I then pick up another book or I'll get into a series like the mm. Enid Blyton books or something, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Or Secret Seven. Secret Seven. All I that. loved all those. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so, so yeah. once I got into a, a book or a particular series, I couldn't get out of it. 
I find myself now in the audiobook world, having read so many books and across various genres and nonfiction, where I feel like that really helps for me on the writing front. There's topics that I wouldn't have known about that I ordinarily wouldn't pick up off the shelf. And I think that broadens your mind just in general, but also as a creative and as a narrator and just really simple stuff that, you know, you learn about history where you're like, oh my gosh, has anyone ever written about that before? Or that's a cool little, you know, you learn about a character from history and you take that yeah. little element of that person and you can feed it into a character you're writing or I don't know, without plagiarizing, of course, but, <laughs> but yeah, where you definitely get inspiration, I think. I, I love history. So a lot of my writing is based on true stories or inspired by true stories. That's for me where the nonfiction, um, yeah, I, get, I really get a little kick out of that kind of stuff too. And I feel like there's a, a big crossover. And also too, on the narration front, you know, having to come up with characters and voices in the, not only, I guess, the prep, but also in the booth itself. I find that that's too, when I write now, I'm hearing all the voices. Uh, okay. In my head, you know, as I, as I'm writing or the dialogue. I mean, I don't know whether that's a I should be um, institutionalized for that, but yeah, I hear I hear voices. I hear voices <laughs> when I write. <laughs> I imagine, given you know your writing, that you like me, a book can be an area well outside your normal range of interests, an area that you just would not engage with. But if the writing is good it's still a pleasant experience where it can be a book about a subject you're passionate about. But if the writing's crap, you just spend your whole time going, oh my God, this writing's so crap, you know, yes. and it gets between you and the enjoyment of the book. Yes, that sometimes does happen, unfortunately, where you're really, more often than not, when you get offered a book, you can at least look it up if it's already up there on Amazon or, you know, you know, pre-sale or something like that. And you can get at least the synopsis and get a feel for what it's going to be about. You know, I've worked on books before where you don't think much would come of it. And then all of a sudden you hear that the book's been picked up for option for a movie or it's become a Netflix series or something like that. That's happened on books that I've worked on. And that's kind of a cool little kick. You know, it's not my book. I haven't written it, but I feel like, you know, play a little part in putting it out into the world. That's also cool when that happens or often a nice little surprise. But, but gets, yeah. It gets a bigger life. Yeah. yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. It's really cool. Well, I think we should let you go and go out into the night and have some dinner. Yes. But thank you very much for not only for this, but having me on board. It's been great to work with you guys on the few productions yep. we've worked on too. You're part of the Square team. You've been listening to the audiobook podcast brought to you by Square Sound. If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio.squaresound.com.au. The audiobook podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan Lees. With special thanks to all our guest speakers, Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening.